Welcome back to Stand, where we help make courage contagious. I'm your host, Kelly Chewbacca, former candidate for U.S. Senate in Alaska and a government watchdog. And I am joined today by my amazing best friend, co-host, and husband, Nikki Chewbacca, who is a civil rights attorney at the Department of Justice. We are so excited to have you today. I'm also excited to say I get to be the chair of the Trump campaign in Alaska, and it is going great. We are so excited to take 2024. We are talking to you today from the land of the midnight sun. We still have snow on the ground here in Anchorage, Alaska. You can be one of our standouts at the Stand Show by going to our website, www.standshow.org, where you can find all of our amazing past episodes. Join us on YouTube, hit subscribe, make sure to follow. We'd love to have you. We also want to let you know we are bringing Alan Dershowitz live to Alaska, June 27th at 7.30 p.m. on our website, standshow.org. You can get one of our tickets. They are going quickly. We have limited seats. So make sure to join us June 27th with Alan Dershowitz. Who is Alan Dershowitz? Some people have asked me. And I say he is the guy who defended Trump at his impeachment trial. Best-selling author, recently wrote The War Against the Jews and The War on Woke. You want to join us. You want to hear it. Get tickets for Alan Dershowitz. You can see him June 27th. We've got a great interview today with Pam Bondi, the first attorney general female in Florida, one of the defense attorneys who worked with Alan Dershowitz on that Trump impeachment trial, currently the chair of the Center for Litigation and co-chair of the Center for Law and Justice at America First Policy Institute, all around fantastic human being going around campaigning for many of our Republican candidates for 2024. You can learn more about Pam and work at AFPI at AmericaFirstPolicy.com. Pam, we are so excited and honored to have you with us today. Uh, thanks, Kelly, and thanks, Nikki. I'm so happy to be here. So sorry about the backdrop. I am in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and doing an event today for Dave McCormick with Lindsey Graham and Morgan Ortegas. So we're re really excited to be here. We are so excited to have you with us, and I hope everything thanks. goes so great across Pennsylvania, all of these toss-up states. This is going to be such a huge election year. Nikki and I are completely rooting for a big red wave in 2024, but Democrats are following their same old playbook, one you're familiar with. It's war by lawfare against President Trump. So they did it in 2020 with this impeachment effort over these allegations that Trump was improperly interfering with investigations into Biden corruption and connection with Ukraine. But it turns out anybody can find this on the House Committee on Oversight and Accountability. They reported that the Bidens have received over $20 million in payments from foreign entities that are not friends of ours. People like China, Ukraine, Romania, they've concluded that, quote, Biden is compromised and our national security is threatened. So, Pam, you were on that defense team with Alan Dershowitz in that first impeachment trial, helping to secure an acquittal for President Trump. Can you tell us yeah. what was your insider take on that trial? You know, Kelly, at the time, we knew very little about that much about Hunter Biden. And, and the whole basis for them to try, try to impeach President Trump was a phone call he made with President Zelensky. Now the whole world knows President Zelensky, of course, um, from Ukraine. And it was about Hunter Biden. And he thought some things didn't seem right. Hunter Biden was on the board, um, an oligarch's board. Um, and Joe Biden said that, that they weren't going to get any money unless they fired a prosecutor who was looking at this oligarch's board. I mean, it was crazy stuff. And now, you know, President Trump said it was a perfect phone call. And now, look in hindsight, of course it was a perfect phone call. Now we know even so much more about what Hunter and the Biden family were, were doing. And yes, I got to know Alan Dershowitz. I still talk to Alan all the time. And you know, Kelly and Nikki, to digress a little bit, back then, it's funny how just the world keeps changing. Alan's, Professor Dershowitz, his big philanthropy, he buys, he gets people to help buy ambulances, you ready for this, for Israel. Wow. And now, after everything happened mm. on October 7th, I get chills. I, I called him and I said, wow, look what your ambulances are doing now. Look what they're doing for our world right now, Alan. Mm. So he, that man does a lot of good. And, you know, Alan's a Democrat. He's a lifelong Democrat. He's a brilliant professor. And, and he, he sees, he saw in that trial what they did to President Trump, and he sees what they're doing now. And, of course, President Trump was completely vindicated, 
more so than ever now because now we know so many they had buried the details we couldn't get nikki we couldn't get half of those documents we couldn't get a fraction of those documents during this impeachment trial because they were trying to bury him because they were going after trump and and now everything that's coming out we still all talk jay Sekulow, alan dershowitz our whole team Pat Cipollone, and we're like, can you believe this? You know, all these documents that they buried and they knew were there, but we couldn't get them because they wanted to remove them from office. That was impeachment round one. And then we keep going. <laughs> yeah, right. It just keeps going. And that's what I want to ask you about next. But I want to follow up on what you just said. There have been so many things that have come out, whether it's the the, the Russia collusion, which has ended up being a hoax and all these things where, you know, you look back and you go, actually, Trump was right. And they just keep coming after him trying to, you know, I think in psychology, don't we call this projection where yeah. you've got an issue and then you just project it on the person you're mad at. And the, the psychiatrist is like, actually, it's you. <laughs> and yeah, and, and that's the problem. Crazy. It is. And it's I feel like it's just so it's such a concerted effort and it's so diabolical um, what they're doing and what they've been able to accomplish. But, you know, that man is so strong and um you know, he should have been sitting in front of the U.S. Supreme Court yesterday, yet, yet he was having to sit in, in, a, in a courthouse in New York City um, on something absolutely ridiculous. And it's, so it's just it's nonstop. But, yeah, I'm glad you brought up impeachment. I call it impeachment round one, um, because that really um, he said from day one, it was a perfect phone call. I had the duty to question what was happening. And now knowing what we did, of course he did. Right. Well, and this lawfare is continuing. So now there's this this imminent trial happening in New York. So they're trying to criminally prosecute him for paying, allegedly paying for a non-disclosure agreement with Stormy Daniels. And there's so much, um, I would just say, questionable conduct around what the prosecutor is doing. Even this Boston University law professor wrote, I think, a the three of us are lawyers, so we would say a pretty compelling analysis in the New York Times, which is not a conservative paper, saying that this is a legal embarrassment for the prosecution. Yeah. And I was yeah. really persuaded by it. I know you were, too. What's your take on this trial and how you think it'll turn out? Yeah, so, so this this is a case that, that um, the Justice Department years ago, years ago, declined to prosecute. The Involving Southern federal District crimes. Of- so the it's Southern. Yeah. The Southern District of New York also declined to prosecute the statute of limitations, which means for non lawyers, you know how long you have to, to, to bring a case has expired years ago, years ago. So now Alvin Bragg and the, the New York D.A., they, they come into this case and they, they basically airdrop in a special prosecutor who is from the Biden administration. You can't make this up. I mean, it's such a concerted effort to get Donald Trump, they bring him in and at best, and there are, are no criminal charges here. Uh, we can talk about that in a minute, but but they take a misdemeanor and they have to log, tack it on, bootstrap it on to 34 felonies just to make it within the statute of limitations so they can bring this, this case years and years later. There's no reason in the world to bring it other than to keep him off the campaign trail. And they're being successful at that right now. They're not going to be successful ultimately, but they're being successful at that because he's having to sit in that courtroom every single day. And, you know, the the, the prosecution star witness yesterday, a guy named Pecker, who was um, head of um, the National Enquirer, said we did non-disclosure agreements all the time. This wasn't Donald Trump the president. Donald Trump was the celebrity. We did him for Arnold Schwarzenegger. He, he rattled off names and names of all these celebrities because that's part of business in the business world when you're a billionaire and people come at you and they're accusing you of things. And so, and, and, and you know, it's it's very detailed. And of course, Michael Cohen is the star witness against President Trump. And, his former and lawyer. He, his former lawyer. So I don't know how they... they Attorney yeah, that client privilege isn't applying here, number one. Right. Right to, to my fellow friends and attorneys. And, you know, he comes in and says all the salacious stuff that he told him to pay her off. But then Pecker, yesterday on the witness, or the, this last week on the witness stand, last week on the witness stand, he comes in and he says, he says, listen, um, Donald Trump didn't know that Michael Cohen paid her off. He had no idea when we talked about it. And Pecker hasn't even talked to Donald Trump since 2019. So th- their case is falling apart, but they don't care. The goal was to try to embarrass him and to have him sitting in a courtroom, which 
they got him. You know, it's a criminal charge, as we know. It's not a civil case. You can't come and go. He has to be sitting in that courtroom. And, and then to take it a step further, you know, as, as attorneys, we know, you know, I prosecuted before I was attorney general for 18 years. And the gag orders used to be on me as a prosecutor. Prosecutors aren't supposed to be talking about the case because you're not supposed to hurt the defendant. All the rights here belong to the accused because he is innocent until proven guilty by a reasonable doubt. Yet they're letting Michael Cohen, that witness, he's out there every day trashing Donald Trump on TV. So they put a gag. I've never seen a gag order on a defendant in my entire career. They put a gag order on Donald Trump saying he can't talk about the court. He can't talk about it's crazy. He can't talk about the main witness who's out there trashing him every single day. You can't make this stuff up. And really as lawyers it's, it's a shame because this is what people are seeing they see this isn't how our justice system typically works it's not it's not I supposed mean, to I mean, be and you're, it's not to your point you're not. supposed to be innocent until proven guilty and this yeah. defendant has no opportunity to defend his innocence in the court mm -hmm. of public opinion where this is being tried every day because he is running for president this is still a campaign fortunately <laughs> I saw a poll, and I think the polls are going to continue to show that as these these trials, this campaign by lawfare continues, he's going to continue to to close the gap in toss up states and even I think pull ahead because Americans don't want to see this. They don't want to see the abuse of our legal system, our justice system against political opponents. We don't live in countries where we tolerate that kind of behavior. We're up against a break. Please stand by. While you're on break, go to standshow.org, go to any of our social media sites, hit subscribe. Make sure to get your tickets to come see Alan Dershowitz, a philanthropist, Trump's impeachment attorney, best-selling author. And we're at standshow.org. So we're back with former Attorney General Pam Bondi. It's so great to have you with us, Pam. Thank you for Thanks, taking Nikki. the time. Um, so you've been talking about lawfare, and you know I was I was thinking about how, oh, let's say back even just eight to ten years ago, uh, the Democrats used lawfare for their sort of social engineering objectives and goals. Right? Uh, they were mm -hmm. trying. They would use. They couldn't get it through legislation, so they would go through the courts. I don't think any of us at the time expected that they would actually take it this far to now use lawfare to persecute, I'm not even going to say prosecute, persecute political yeah. opponents. It is stunning. And it is a thing, I mean, we've heard it over and over again, but it's true. It's the stuff of a banana republic. And, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they focus on, well, this is just about this person. We all know that it's not just about this person. Once you get started down this road, it's really hard to pull back. So now we, we were talking about with the, the criminal prosecution right now that's going going on in New York. But at the, <laughs> the same day that Trump is sitting in that court, the Supreme Court is deciding another issue. And that issue is the issue of presidential immunity and how far that extends for official acts done by uh, a president while he or she is in office. And it's been it's a case that uh, Jack Smith has has brought against the president trying to drum up uh, some kind of charges against him over the whole J6 affair. It's completely ridiculous. And it's, um, I think, really undermining the office of the presidency at uh, great cost and peril to the American people. So I wanted to ask you a little bit uh, about your thoughts on that. How do you think the Supreme Court will will rule on that particular issue? Yeah, and, and, and Nikki, it, it truly is. And Jack Smith, once again, is trying to rush this as fast as he can um, because he wants it, you know. I've not, have you ever seen prosecutors rush a case? You know, that's the defense attorney's right to, you know, to have enough time. And so once again, um, Jack Smith's at it again. But yeah, I think President Trump's attorneys did such a, a great job. And, and ultimately, I, th I think they're going to rule probably um, – late June, July, the Supreme Court, and there are three options. They can say complete immunity case dismissed, probably not the most likely thing given the questions they ask. They could say there's no immunity and say start trial tomorrow. Probably not going to happen. I think most likely what's going to happen is they are going to rule that there is immunity, um, but it's going to be remanded back to the appellate court, back to the trial court to make the determinations on what acts are immune and what acts are not immune. Um, 
what acts were in his personal capacity. And, you know, so under there's a case called um, Nixon v. Fitzgerald, and that established civil immunity for all presidents. And the inference is criminal immunity also applies. And I think all the justices' questions were right in line with that. You know, if, if, if we don't have criminal immunity for presidents while they're in office, I'm telling you, they're just gonna become a figurehead. They won't be able to do anything. Every former president will be prosecuted by a political opponent, period. The one that should be the most worried about this is Joe Biden. Seriously, it, it, I mean, Harry Truman would have been prosecuted back in the day. Um, you know, if, if you dropped a bomb, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, prosecuted. Right. Abe Lincoln probably would have been prosecuted. Yep. Every single every single president would be subject to prosecution. So, I, and the Supreme Court asked very thoughtful questions that, that all the justices did. So that's my best guess. Of course, we don't know how they're going to rule, but that's my best guess. And, and once it gets, if it gets remanded back um, to the lower courts, it will take months and months and months of just briefing on all of these issues. And then it will be post-election and they won't care anymore. <laughs> right. Jack Smith's whole strategy just falls apart in that regard. So yeah, that's great. That's a, that, that right there is a victory, too, for uh, for President Trump. Uh, and speaking of whom, you know, a lot of people <clears throat> wonder why is it people on the other side of the aisle, even some Republicans, why why are people so um, loyal to President Trump? Why are they so passionate about supporting him? And for those of us who've had uh, some level of personal interaction with him. Uh, and I mean, I haven't had the kind of interaction that you and Kelly have had, but just the, the short yeah. interactions I've had with him, just a wonderful man um, who loves yeah. our country and is sincere and genuine in his passion to make America great. And so um, I was wondering if you could just talk to our audience a little bit. You've had You've had a lot of interaction with him. You've been with him for uh, a while, supporting him, advocating for him. Uh, through these these various crises, why do you uh, why do you stick with President Trump? Why have you stuck with him throughout all of this? Well, I, I care about him like 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 I do a family member. I mean, I've known him before he was president. Before he thought he'd run for president, I adore Melania. I was just at her mom's funeral recently, and and you know, I, I get to see the, the the real President Trump, not not the celebrity. I got to see. A husband supporting his wife, his grieving wife who had just lost her mother. That's the man that, that I know. He's a great father. His kids are all friends of mine. Um, you, you know, and, and uh, to tell you just like a, a personal story about the man that I know, Nikki um, was one day and it was when the world was about to shut down and, and he was in the White House and he was still up in the residence because he had been making calls all night long to world leaders. And I never tell personal stories about him really, but this one just is so important to me. And um, his assistant at the time was down in the Oval Office, and it was early in the morning. So I called her instead of calling him because I, I don't like to call him early in the morning. And um, an organization that's like Make a Wish, it's called Dreams Come True in Florida. They had reached out to me. They tracked me down because they knew how close I was to, to the president. And they said, "We have this little boy, and he's dying of leukemia." And they said, "All he wants, I get chills. All he wants." is to get to talk to the president. We don't know how long he's got, can you help us? And um, he had leukemia, He, Jake was like 10 or 12. And of course his head was you know, bald from the, the chemo and he had little friends with him and they sent me all these pictures of him. So I sent them to the president's assistant, all these pictures and I said, listen, this little boy isn't gonna make it long. His dad is former military, his mom's a nurse. And when he was in the hospital getting his treatments, he covered, he was covered in the American flag as his blanket, all the nurses gave him. Mm -hmm. And he had on his MAGA socks and he was just adorable. And he just loved the president. And that was his, the only wish that they hadn't been able to make true, come true for this little boy. And they said, listen, he does not have long, it's really bad. So I said, okay, let me see what I can do. So I called the White House and his assistant went up to the residence and said, President, the, the, the picture she didn't have that they were on her computer. She went up and she told the president's story. I, I just told you this little boy is about to die. All he wants to do is talk to you. So he calls me. Pam, wh what's the number? What's the number? What's the number? We've got to talk to him. He writes the number down. He writes the number down himself. This is our world leader when everything is going on in the world. This was, and so he says, okay, I'll call, let me call him. Hangs up. 
makes a call, couldn't get through, calls me back, Pam, they're not answering, I don't know, I don't know. So I called the little boy's sister and they weren't answering because they were baptizing him at the time mm-hmm. in the family pool because he was about to die. So um, so they, um, so I said, President, they were baptizing Jake. So he goes, okay, let me try again. So he calls back, he gets him on the phone and all this was captured, the phone call on video because they had a videographer there baptizing Jake. So that's how I know the details of the phone call. And uh, I'll never reveal that, it'll never be public, but it was one of the most beautiful phone calls I've ever heard between a man and a dying little boy who looked up to this man. And it was like a father figure talking to this little boy and talking to his parents. And it was just so beautiful and so kind. And um, and so call ended and, and, and the president called me back and said, thank you, I got to talk to him. Pam, let me know next week how's he doing let me know how he's doing okay i want to send him some stuff so then the president um we hang up he comes down he's in the oval office and i call it a swag room they have a room outside the oval office with all this stuff like stuffed animals and all presidents have it like really cool stuff for kids who come to visit and people and so his assistant told me he said get me a box and he went in there with a big box all this is the president this is this is the man that i love with a big box and started filling it with stuffed animals mm-hmm. and stuff, swag. And he saw the picture up on his assistant's screen of the little boy with a bald head in a golf cart with another child with a bald head, you know, cause they were going through chemo. He saw it and he said, print that picture. And she printed it and he wrote on there, um, I still have that picture of, I still have a copy of that picture. Dear Jake, please look over all of us in heaven. Love, mm. Donald Trump. He framed it, he packed up the box, they overnighted it to the family, but I had a screenshot of the the picture. So I got to call the family, I sent the family the screenshot of the picture. So Jake saw the picture and then they overnighted all all the the, the things. And then the next day um, they called back, Pam, did Jake get everything? And I said, no, sir, Um, he died early this morning but mm. he got to see the picture that, that you signed for him. And now the family, they have all of that. And they asked if, if they could go public with the video. And you know, and I said, no, it was, a, and, and they agreed. It, it was a, a private time between a man and a little boy. So that's the man that I know. And people could tell you a hundred stories like that of things that he does for kids and families. And that's why the people that truly know him, Kelly knows him, people that know him, you know, you love him. He's a, he's a good man. What what you see on TV is the showman, which is mm. hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it is. Appreciate that, wow, Pam. Thanks for sharing story. that. Yeah, sure. it definitely brought tears to my eyes. Uh, we're coming up on a break. I'll share. I'll talk with you, Nikki, after the break about uh, my personal first encounter with President Trump. But I agree with you that you know after you know somebody when they get vilified and maligned in the media, then you're like, nah, not true. I know, <laughs> false, yeah. fake news, mm-hmm. I know that person. And then when you run for US Senate and get vilified and maligned in the media with mm. things that they've just made, completely made up, then you're like, well, that's how that works then. And then everyone just goes around parroting the lies. You're like, that's exactly how, it's a slander campaign. Yeah. And it just catches fire like the Salem witch trials. And so everyone in their fear fest goes around spreading the lies and fears and fear mongering. Mm-hmm. I don't think anybody is perfect and I'm not hiring a, a priest, people who also aren't perfect to be the leader of the nation. Um, I don't think any any leader has held themselves out to be perfect, but this uh, this man has, is not who the left media portrays him to be. And as we've talked about all these trials by lawfare, they definitely uh, have gone down, they've, they've projected a bit and have gone down roads that in retrospect have proven Trump to be right. So I am hoping and believing that throughout the year he'll be vindicated by many of these trials that they'll boomerang back and we'll all go, well, actually he was right. And I think a lot of America is waking up to see that that actually is the case, that now, this weaponization of the legal system might indeed be the greatest threat to our democracy and our republic and a government led by the people when a weaponized legal system, a weaponized court system, when the party in charge can use 
their law enforcement, their courts, their military to come down on the civilians of the United States of America, that might be the greatest threat that we're facing. And so I appreciate you being with us today, Pam. Thank you so much. Uh, This has been another fantastic interview on Stand. We're going to pick up just on the other side of this break. You can get all our episodes at standshow.org. Hit subscribe. Get your tickets for Alan Dershowitz coming live to Alaska June 27th. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. We just finished up our interview with Pam Bondi, who has worked in many respects with President Trump and currently is going around campaigning for candidates who are running for U.S. Senate uh, in the United States. And I was just so touched, Nikki, by the conversation she shared with us that she had with President Trump for this young boy who was passing away in Florida. When you asked her, why does she stick with President Trump with all the allegations and the negative media and the things that are said, why does she stick with him? And it reminds me when people ask me about what President Trump's like and my first my first interaction with him. So, you know, I've seen I've seen the news and I'd seen him at his rallies, kind of the rally persona, if you will. And you and I, I think, watched every episode of The Apprentice back when he was a uh, um, I don't know, it's not a talk show host, but a media personality, if you will, you're fired, right? We love that. And do you remember when I went in and got my, I had to go ask for the endorsement for the U.S. Senate campaign. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I had to do all this prep work and I wasn't sure which President Trump I was going to get. Is it the, you're fired President Trump? The boardroom President Trump. Right. Or is it the rally President Trump? Right. <laughs> or is it, the MSNBC version of President Trump, you know, um, I don't know. And fortunately, having had the experience I'd had in federal government, briefing cabinet members all the time, and and then in executive boardrooms at the time, I had just finished being one of the cabinet members for governor of Alaska. I was really familiar with giving briefs to senior government officials. So going in and briefing him was not a particularly intimidating experience. I thought that was fine. I've been with a lot of bright people. So I felt prepared. I just didn't know really what to expect. So this was at the top of Trump Tower. And my team that was had been briefing me, they were very nervous for me. I mean, just <laughs> sweating and jittery. I think they're nervous I was going to bomb. I think they were nervous that I was so calm. I, I walked in and I w- was first struck by how grandfatherly he was. And so just like what Pam was talking about, this doesn't ever come across in his kind of TV persona or even in the YouTube videos, whatever you watch of him being presidential. Uh, he, In his personal mannerisms, he's actually very paternal, very tender, very kind, very gentle. Uh, the other thing that struck me is having been in many executive boardrooms, oftentimes the only woman in the room at no time did I ever feel demeaned. I was with him for about an hour. Never felt demeaned, condescended to, objectified in any way, which was shocking because that happens to me regularly. And at this point, it's just sort of like, you know, being a woman in an executive world. But at, at no point did I ever feel like this person who is so much more accomplished, so much more financially empowered so much more powerful i mean imagine the experiences he's had as president he didn't feel patronized at all no absolutely not and in fact there were many ways and words that he used to equalize me and i thought um no that's actually that's factually inaccurate i am not your peer um, in any way i mean he has uh, decades of more experience than me in so many ways but he he went out of his way to honor me which I thought was interesting. Uh, not not what I expected, not because of what people have said about him, but just based on my previous experiences, like everywhere, right? <laughs> and so, and then finally, I was just absolutely astounded by how incredibly intelligent he is. Having been with really intelligent people, like a couple really intelligent people. Oh, you're married to one. 
I mean, I'm <laughs> married married to one for sure. In all I'm, humility, I'm, you yes, say that, yes, right? Of and That's having good. gone to school with some some really intelligent people, and then knowing sure. really bright people, he is one of the most intelligent people I've ever met. So he would ask a question. And then a normal response time, unlike how I'm talking now, by the way, I'll just acknowledge I've talked for a little bit here. A normal response time for someone on a question is about 90 seconds, sometimes two minutes. Like if you leave a voicemail, it's about 60 seconds is about how often somebody talks on a quick voicemail. And he would process what I was saying and cut me off at a 30 to 45 seconds. And then he would switch the subject to something totally different. So how are you going to win this race? And I would start to tell him my strategy. What are your polls? I'd start to tell him my strategy. Who supports you? I'd start to tell him my strategy. How are you going to win the world vote? I'd start to tell him. And he would just pepper me with questions. And it wasn't that he was interrupting and being rude. He was just that far ahead of me. And then he would fact check me. And so I would tell him, okay, here are my, here are my polling numbers. He, okay, hold on. Let me check. And he'd call his pollster right there. So I knew apprentice style, having watched the show, if I were wrong, it would have been, you're fired, right? And I would have been shown the door. It would have been, you don't get the endorsement. Who supports you? I told him. So then he would, just like Pam said, he would just call a random Alaskan. He'd say to his secretary, yell at the door, get me so-and-so's number. She'd say, so-and-so's on the line. <laughs> <laughs> And getting a cold call from the the president to say, hey, what do you think about Kelly Chewbacca? And then this went on for like an hour. But what I love about that story, too, I mean, you were talking about his, um, how paternal he was, how professional he was, how kind he was, how, um, it sounds like even humble he was in terms of That's his right. interactions with you. <clears throat> what I also appreciate about it is how... Uh, insightful his questions were to you and how prepared he was yeah right? with no notes because he's uh, he's lived for decades as an executive as a ceo right mm -hmm. he knows that he uh how to grasp a, a bunch of information um digest it get to the the core pieces the valuable pieces of it that he needs to um to make whatever decision he needs to make and just in terms of how you've talked about his interactions and in his in his interview with you for the endorsement um how well prepared he was, how you were saying he was even a step ahead of you. Um, that that makes me think about, hmm, I wonder if that's what he's also like in the Oval Office when he's, you know, making decisions. Yeah, good right? point. Um, and that gives me a lot of peace of mind <laughs> compared to what we currently oh, have, right, in um, in in the Oval Office. So um, that's a that's a really cool story. I mean, I I really enjoyed the couple of times that. Uh, I got to interact with him when I when I was when I was with you, and just also struck by just how approachable um, and down to earth he was, and that's why people love him, mm -hmm. right? He's not an elitist, and uh, that resonates uh, with uh, with the rest of America. Yeah, super gracious, and I really appreciate and respect how Pam is spending her time helping these people campaign. Yeah. I would love to see us have a red wave in 2024, which is what so many of us were expecting in 2022. And instead, in some parts of the country, we got a red trickle. And you know, now with what's happening in the house, I think it's hard to even say we got that. And so I think one of the questions that I wanna chat with you about, and we might have to carry this over the break is, how do we guarantee, how do we get, maybe guarantee is a strong word, a red wave? How do we get a red wave in 2024? One of the things I'm realizing, we're, we're up against a really big mayor race here in Anchorage, right around the corner. Right. And one of the things I've noticed, I'm just going to be super direct about it because I know you can take it because we're married. And I'm hoping our <laughs> audience can because if you're watching a show called Stand, then you can weather a storm. I just want to just say, maybe it's not Democrats winning races or the left winning races. Maybe it's Republicans losing them. Can we just be blunt about it? When we don't show up to volunteer, when we won't hit the ground in the pavement for candidates like Pam's doing, when we won't open our pocketbooks and put our money where our complaining mouths are, then that's how we lose races across the country. Or so when we won't vote. 
When, like, and when you won't really freaking get out to. to vote, just yeah. do the basic work of speaking your voice through a vote instead of speaking it at the bar, on social media, and at the water cooler, then that's how you lose races. If you want to stop a losing streak, then do something. Yeah, and you know, we talk a lot about, and we'll, I, we'll talk more about this after the break, but we talk a lot about the red wave, right? We want a red wave. I just... I, I I think a lot of people right now, um, I know I'm at this at this place at least, and just conversations I've had with people, things I'm reading, um, they the wave that they want is just a let's be in America again wave, right? Like um, whether it's it's not so much a color wave as it is a you know versus red versus blue, but a a let's just say a spangled wave. Right, a return to what we're really supposed to be about because this administration has led us so far astray, so far astray of who we are as a country. I mean, it's shocking what they have done to tear down uh, our institutions, our values, um, our, our educational system. I mean, it is, it's, it's horrifying. And so, uh, this is an opportunity coming up in this election for us to uh, to vote for people and leaders who are going to pull us back from what I would say the precipice of the abyss. Um, because if if we don't, uh, we are going to not recognize our country, and what we're going to be passing down to our children is a country that is not the America that we knew. I think that's a good point. What I would tell you. It's a great point. It's a great point. <laughs> is that spangled wave right now? If you, I love that that picture is encompassed by values that are red. Yes. So it would be a free market economy. It would be secure borders. It would be resource development. So we're not dependent on foreign adversaries for energy. It'd be our traditional values. Those are the kinds of things that we are fighting for. But we're, I would say... Here's a little bit of Nikki and Kelly back and forth. But I would say that there are a lot of Americans who are not traditional Republicans. I think that's fair. Who are part of that spangled Who now agree wave. with that. Who, who, yeah, who are. Who Which are, means who, our party is getting bigger. Yes. We're up on a break. <laughs> <laughs> and join us on the other side, standshow.org. Hit subscribe. Grab your Alan Dershowitz tickets. We'll see you in a minute. Stand by. Welcome back. We are you are watching or listening to Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca, and we were just talking about how are we going to see a uh, or get a red wave, what I called a spangled wave, um, you know, this coming election cycle. When I say spangled, I I'm thinking about all of the people who who haven't necessarily called themselves Republicans, but are aligning themselves. Um, with this, the Republican Party now um, that, that Trump has created that's really expanded its, uh, its tent pegs. We are bringing in people, independents and even Democrats, who um, before never would have imagined themselves uh, part of um, this uh, Make America Great Again movement. So one of the things I was thinking about, Kelly, in terms of how do we, how do we see this wave um, happen is— in some ways, I think uh, Biden and his uh, his folks, we'll just I'll call them folks, um, are are creating that and generating that wave for us. I am as frustrated as uh, any other supporter of Trump, uh, seeing him basically being gagged uh, by uh, a judge when he has a First Amendment right to speak. It just goes to how they are continually trying to change the rules of the game, so to speak, um, to uh, to keep him silenced and to uh, defeat him in this election. Those kinds of things are actually galvanizing the masses. It's 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 exciting us to be uh, to push back and say that is not the America we want. That is not the America we believe in. That is not the America we, we pay our taxes to support. That is not the America that our soldiers go 
go out and bleed and die for. That is not the America that our founders um, uh, established. That is not the America we want to pass down to our children. And, and so the more that they do this, the more they are, um, the more they are inspiring and emboldening uh, Americans across the country, uh, including Americans who traditionally were on uh, opposite sides of, uh, of, if not the political aisle, um, uh, the social values aisle, whatever you want to call it, um, to come and coalesce behind the president, because we want to make a statement uh, to those elitists, to those people who think that they can puppeteer uh, the strings of government and control um, our lives and intimidate us into silence, that no, we will not be silent. Um, we know what our rights are. We know the America that um, our soldiers have died for, and that's the America we want to pass down to our children, not this America that you are trying to create where you're persecuting, you know, political opponents um, and and using um, a system of justice in a way that is so corrupt. Uh, it just boggles the mind. And we are losing, in, in addition to all of that, we're losing our, uh, our ability to, to speak with authority to our uh, to other nations about justice, about freedom, about rights, because of what we're doing right now, we have totally undermined, um, I think, uh, our standing and what we've done before the American people and before the world. And our founders warned about this. So remember, yep. in the beginning they said it's incumbent on us to create this form of government because the ruling party, the ruling class in England has committed these abuses against the people and government can only lead by the consent of those governed. And therefore we have an obligation to do something. And then they also said, now that we've created this government, it's up to us to then have the obligation to manage and lead it here. And I think it is because of apathy, complacency, um, maybe being too busy, that we have become a little bit complicit in what's happening. And I think we have to take ownership of that. When we have the lowest voter turnout in history, when elections are being decided by 18, 20 percent of a population. You're talking about in Alaska, lowest voter turnout? Yeah, in Alaska. But we weren't the only state. There were other jurisdictions that, while some places had really high voter turnout in our last election cycle, 2022, other states had, toss-up states, had really low turnout. And then you talk about local races, which, by the way, are the building ground, the building blocks and the breeding ground for politicians and leaders to then move up to state and national politics. Decisions are being made by a fifth of the population. And our founders would say that's the problem. In fact, one of the people who wrote an extremely compelling book, which these two political science nerds have read, but I think most of our population hasn't. He said the the greatest risk to this new American system of government, which has never been created before, nothing like this has ever been created, and I don't think anything could ever be created since. He said the greatest risk is not from the outside. He, he said you will have a lot of political enemies. You will have your battles and wars, which we've done pretty well in, guys. He said the greatest threat to, threat to America will be from the inside. It'll be from Americans who who will not responsibly handle what has been given to them. And through taxation, through not managing the government that they have, they will get drunk on power or drunk on complacency, and they will let the whole thing fall apart. You're talking about the Tocqueville? Yes. Yes. <laughs> that was a great paraphrase. Yeah, nice Alexis pop the, nice the, pop quiz there, yeah, taking the you all the way back to college. Yeah. You know, and that's 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 so important because you know, the point that he 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 makes is the, the beauty of the American experiment, but also the, the fragility of it, right? And we have I think lost an appreciation for how fragile freedom is. Um and and but we're seeing it. 
right now, right? We saw it with COVID. Uh, we're seeing it with what uh, the Biden administration has done in, in so many ways, not just um, within our educational system, but also obviously with what they're doing to the president. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's an awakening, I think, for, for all of us. And so what do we do? We stand. How do we stand? We use our voices. We get up, we go out there, we advocate for uh, the America that the traditional values that, that we believe in, that have made America the, the greatest civilization, the greatest nation ever in history. Um, and we vote, we vote. Whether our votes are counted, whether there's chicanery that happens, that's on whoever does it. But we, I think, always have to, to, to take ownership of our responsibility sure. and say, whatever, whatever the outcome, it's not going to be because we failed to engage in our civic responsibilities to uh, advocate for what we believe uh, America should be um, and is about. I think another thing we can do is get involved. Yeah. So a lot of times what I'll hear is, well, that's uncomfortable and that's awkward. Yes, that's correct. I just want to validate that. And as you've heard me say to our kids many times, life is a series of awkward moments separated by snacks. Well, for you it is. <laughs> <laughs> I excel in the awkward. Yes, you do. I've I've made it I've made it one of my sub expertises. I should add that to my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> Keep us all entertained. <laughs> yes, but if we just acknowledge that if something's going to go awkward today then everything just gets a lot easier. So now door knocking, for example, or cold calling people becomes a lot easier when you realize it's just as awkward for me as it feels for you. So if you just jump in to the swimming pool of awkward, this whole thing warms up if you just get in and start swimming. So call that person who you want to be supporting or the thing, the candidate, the campaign that you want to win and say, how can I help? There's all kinds of ways to help, even being a keyboard warrior and getting the word out on social media, not to your 92 followers, but to posting in social media groups in places where people are actually there and listening, that can influence things. But making calls, phone banking, door knocking, stretching yourself and giving some dollars, even $5 will really help. These are the kind of things that actually make elections get across the finish line and win if we want to take a stand. And then there are other issues and causes to get involved in that help push the nation forward as well. But 2024 is going to be a really critical race. And again, I don't think that the left is winning because they win. As my mom would tell me growing up playing sports, honey, you didn't win, you didn't lose that, or they didn't win that game, you lost that game. And you can decide how you play. And it's not always that, well, you know, they just outplayed us. That's not how it goes. We have a choice in how this goes. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, I'm really optimistic. I'm optimistic for 2024. And um, I mean, I, 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 I don't know if you're feeling it, but I'm just, I'm, I'm feeling it as I'm, I'm watching the news and reading articles. There is, there's people are a, coming together yeah, in a new there's way. There's a coalescing. Mm -hmm. There's something that's happening that I, I think can be and will be very positive um, going forward as as we come together as a nation and agree. Like we may have our differences, but we all agree that what we're seeing right now that's not us, and that's, that's not, not who America. We're be. Yeah, right. We want leaders who are agreed on what America is. And what it means, for example, is that we have a border. <laughs> yeah. Right? right. Just the basics. Just the, the basics. basics. Yeah. <laughs> right. And and it means that we're not getting taxed at such an absurd percentage that we can't feed our families. Like super basics like that. It means that as parents, like we actually have the right to parent our, our children, children and <laughs> and and not have the educational system have secret conversations with them about, you know, we didn't delegate out. We didn't surrender our parental rights without anybody telling us. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So this is Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. You can find us at standshow.org. We're so glad that you joined us today. Make sure to get your tickets for Alan Dershowitz if you are in Alaska, live in Alaska. If you're not in Alaska, what a great time to come to Alaska right. this June. Make sure that you align it with the, the trip for Alan Dershowitz on June 27th. Standshow.org. Hit subscribe. Follow us. We will see you next week. We're so glad to have you as one of our standouts. Stands firm and stand strong.